Hello, Fair Lawn Animal Score. This is Dr. Barr back again, and this time we're here with episode five, Drugs of Abuse. This time I've decided to just audio record because the video in the corner was just kind of blocking the graphics and everything. So uh, just going to hear me speak over the slides this time. Um, and since we're in the midst of a number of epidemics, but one of them is the opioid epidemic, I thought it pertinent to give you guys a talk about um, drugs of abuse and what you can do and what you should expect in the EMS setting. So let's take a moment as usual to uh, read my disclaimer here. And this time I do have one disclosure. I am going to talk a little bit about Suboxone uh, as a treatment for opioid use disorder. I don't get any money from drug companies or I don't have any financial conflict of interest, but I will mention it today. and. Um, I will also uh, be talking about this topic, which is a little bit beyond the scope of BLS, but I think it's worth it for you guys to know about because I'm hoping it will come to an ALS unit near you soon. Okay, so what are we going to go through today? We're going to do a, a quick drug recap on all the different uh, drug classes and what you can do about them. We'll talk about some current trends, and then we'll get into therapy for opiate use disorder beyond naloxone. That's the suboxone I just mentioned there. First, let's do a quick review. So in a setting of someone who's intoxicated, what's more important than identifying the relevant agent is understanding the clinical toxidrome. So what is a toxidrome? A toxidrome is a constellation of symptoms that relate to a specific drug intoxicant. These are the main toxidromes here. So anticholinergic, cholinergic, opioid, sympathomimetic, and sedative hypnotic. And by this point, many of you have probably seen one or more of these toxidromes, if not all of them, but it's good to quick review them. So let's start with anticholinergic. So anticholinergic toxidromes, you can see here, increase the heart rate and blood pressure. They don't only affect the respirations. They increase the temperature. They dilate the pupils. Bowel sounds will be decreased, and the patient is going to be dry. And I want to really emphasize that they're going to be dry. Anticholinergic is very similar to sympathomimetic. Note some key differences with sympathomimetic are, one, they're going to be wet. So this is the easiest way to tell the difference between the two. So someone who's sweaty and amped up is different than someone who's dry and amped up. Okay, you can see also there's a little bit difference in respiratory rate, but I think the easiest way to tell the difference clinically is on physical exam, feel the skin. Is the skin sweaty or dry? And that'll help you distinguish between sympathomimetic and anticholinergic. Things that cause anticholinergic toxicity are common medications like scopolamine, Benadryl, Benztropine, Doxylamine. Um, those are the things that you might have some anticholinergic toxicity from. Sympathomimetic is like your caffeine, cocaine, amphetamine. Also things like your Ritalin. Um, most hallucinogenic agents like LSD and ecstasy also have some sympathomimetic effects, so you can look for that with those. Now, we talked about anticholinergic and sympathomimetic since they're very similar and related. Let's talk about the opposite of anticholinergic or cholinergic. Cholinergic, you have to remember, are your sludgeum. So that's salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, emesis. So those are your, your agents that are either um, organophosphate poisons or other nerve gases sometimes can cause cholinergic poisoning. And the treatment for them is going to be to give uh, anticholinergic, like atropine, as an antidote, which um, your ALS units will have. So by contrast to the others, you're going to see pinpoint pupils rather than dilated pupils. Hyperactive instead of hypoactive bowel sounds, if you compare that to the anticholinergic. And remember, we said anticholinergic is dry, so cholinergic must be wet. And they're definitely going to be wet because they have it coming out of every orifice if they're, if they're really cholinergically poisoned. Let's go back down to opioid, since this is one of the most common toxicities. And this is going to be your morphine, codeine, heroin, fentanyl, oxycodone, all of those medications. It's going to lower your heart rate and blood pressure. But most importantly, it's going to lower your respirations, and that's what kills people. Temperature's a bit down, pinpoint pupils. This is often easy to pick up. 
And if anything, they're going to be a little, little more moist, hypoactive bowel sounds. Remember, opioids cause extreme constipation. And then sedative hypnotic, this is your alcohol, your benzodiazepines, your Xanaxes, barbiturates. In general, they're going to lower everything because they're a downer as well, and these, these people are going to be wet. Now, you might say this is hard to distinguish from opioids, and you'd be right. But generally, the level of respiratory depression is a little bit less than that of opioids, and you're not going to see the pupil findings like you would see in opioids. Now, in general, the treatment for toxicologic in ingestion is supportive care. Any poisoning, you're going to think supportive care. So what does supportive care mean? Supportive care means not enough oxygen, give oxygen. Not enough breathing, give breathing, breaths. Not enough circulatory support, support the circulation with fluids or pressors, and you might need ALS for that. And then antidotes. So the main antidote many of you may be familiar with is Narcan. That's the main one we have for your opioids. You don't really have too many others at your disposal at the BLS level, but you may need to request ALS for antidotes. And so Narcan is going to be the big one we're going to talk about. Let's review in a little more detail. So some central nervous system stimulants, such as cocaine and methamphetamine, are going to cause the sympathomimetic toxidrome. Now you could use this little acronym to remember it here. I simply remember it as everything is up. Heart rate's up, blood pressure's up, pupils are big. Um, the main management of these is going to be, like I said, supportive care. Um, at the BLS level, that's what you're going to be limited to. At the ALS level, you can use some benzos for uh, agitation. Um, and so you might need ALS to help you if they're really amped up and really agitated. And what about hallucinogens? So hallucinogens are going to have some sympathomimetic effects like the sympathomimetic. So that's why I include them next. Um, they often can produce high body temperatures as well as those, what they say they do, the hallucinations or sensory disturbances. Nausea and vomiting often uh, accompanies these agents as well. And this is your LSD, peyote, psilocybin, ecstasy, and then dextromethorphan. Uh, sometimes you may have heard that called robo tripping. And this is why in CVS, you'll find this often locked up or not easily accessible anymore. It's because this is found in cough medicine. Okay, so let's review the CNS depressants next. So that's your alcohol, benzodiazepines, barbiturates, and GHB. Now the effect of these is going to depend on the amount ingested and the time ingested. Um, this graph shows time on the x-axis, breath alcohol uh, concentration on the y-axis, and also um, measuring the change from baseline. And you'll see here that if you look at uh, initially what happens is as you drink, your breath alcohol concentration rises and then it slowly kind of falls down here. Now if you look at the stimulation, stimulating effects, you'll notice that as it rises there's an initial kind of bump in stimulation. What you see over time is that the stimulant effect goes down but the sedation goes up. And so People initially who drink, they get a little bit stimulated and then eventually start to get sedated. And this is true with the benzos and the other agents in this class as well. The main management for these is going to be supportive care. Make sure they're clearing vomit from the airway, suction, oxygen, and supporting them through it while they sober up. Next up are our dissociative anesthetics like PCP and ketamine. Now these have a number of different effects, including bizarre behavior, violent behavior, nystagmus, so you could see weird eye movements, both vertical and horizontal. Ketamine also, they also cause amnesia, so the patient forgets, and analgesia, so they don't feel pain very well. And these patients oftentimes can be quite agitated, they can appear like the Hulk, and they can be quite dangerous, so you need to be very careful with these. Request law enforcement, request ALS, they may need chemical uh, sedation in addition to physical restraint if they're dangerous to themselves or others. Next up is narcotics. These are going to be your opioids, opiates. Um, these are medications like oxycodone, Percocet, Vicodin, and also your street drugs like street heroin. Um, fentanyl is both a, a medicine and also a street drug, and it's in almost everything now, so you have to watch out for that. It's especially potent, and we'll talk more about that later. 
The opioid toxidrome is one you should commit to memory because it's very common and it's one that you can do something about. So you're going to look for one, respiratory depression. That's what kills people. You're going to provide bag mass ventilation, drop an NPA, pinpoint pupils is another easy way to find it, and everything else is going to be down. Hypotension, hypothermia, hyporeflexia, they may be pure comatose. In fact, many people think these people are in cardiac arrest, but they're actually probably just in respiratory arrest and comatose. So you're going to provide bag mass ventilation. You're going to provide Narcan. And uh, that's what you're going to do in these cases, and you're going to need ALS. Now, what about our inhalants? So these are things like toluene, paint thinner, aerosol cans. They have a bunch of different effects on the body. Most of them are not worth memorizing specifically because the treatment is just going to be supportive care. But there is one thing you should watch out for. There is a sudden sniffing death syndrome where people can die after sniffing these pretty quickly. It's thought to be due to sen sensitization of the myocardium followed by arrhythmias, and it often occurs with sympathetic stimulation, um, including even masturbation. So there have been reports of people who have suddenly died after masturbating while sniffing these. So it's thought it might be related to arrhythmias and low oxygen levels. So just something to be aware of. If someone's near a bunch of paint cans and cardiac arrest, that, that's what may have happened to them. All right, now everyone's more and more popular nowadays is, is cannabis, especially as it becomes legal recreationally. It was recently legalized recreationally in New Jersey, and so I'm going to give a little spotlight on this more later. But this includes marijuana, its derivatives, such as dronabinol, cannabidiol, as well as synthetic cannabinoids. What I think most people don't realize is that cannabis really acts on all these different areas of the brain and produces a wide variety of effects. Um, and so I'm going to talk more in depth about cannabis later, so I'm not going to say more about it here, but um, it can cause a lot of different toxic effects, and we're seeing more and more of it as it becomes more legal. So let's get into that, um, because I think this is a new and upcoming topic, and I want to make you guys up to date on it and informed about it. Before we get too far into it, I'm not going to really comment anything about the legality of whether or not marijuana should be legal. I'm really going to be talking about the health effects and the toxic effects that you need to be aware of as EMS providers because you're likely to encounter more and more patients with symptoms of marijuana toxicity as access becomes more uh, readily it becomes more readily accessible and be, it becomes uh, legal recreationally uh, in New Jersey, which it is as of, as of April this year. So just to give you some perspective, these are the states where marijuana is legal recreationally. You'll see New Jersey is in green, so that is, in fact, legal recreationally in New Jersey. Now, what we've seen over time is that as society has become more tolerant and thinks that weed is less dangerous, more teens are using it. And so what you see here in this chart is that over time, and this is this is only goes to 2013, but likely continues beyond this, is that the perceived risk of marijuana, which was the highest in the early 90s, is going down. At the same time, use in the past year is going up. So people in at the teenage level are thinking marijuana is less dangerous, and they're using more because they think it's le they're thinking it's less dangerous. We're also seeing that cigarette use has gone down, while marijuana use has been steadily trickling up. According to the CDC, in fact, 48.2 million Americans are using cannabis, and that's about 18%. So a large population, a large part of the population uses cannabis um, to some degree. And so this is really common, um, and many people use and never have an issue, but many also do have severe problems, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what can happen. Now, some people were wondering, you know, after... Um, cannabis became legalized. If more people were using it, would more people end up in the ER? And in fact, yes, in fact, they do. In fact, with legalization of cannabis, and a lot of this data comes from Colorado, ER visits just continue to go up for marijuana-related issues. And one of the reasons that seems to be driving this is that the marijuana that's out there today is not the weed your parents smoked. This isn't the same weed from the 70s and 80s. This, the weed that's out there today, the marijuana in the percentage of THC, which is a psychoactive component, is steadily going up and up and up. So if you look here as, you know, this chart only goes back to the 90s, 
but THC percentage was two to four percent. We're now looking at 10, 12, you know, 10 to 12 percent in regular THC, but there's also edibles which have up to 50 percent THC, and marijuana butters and other products like Shatter, which have close to 100 percent THC. And so the relative potency of marijuana has gone up, and there's higher and higher percentages of THC out there. Again, down below demonstrated here is that marijuana related ED visits are going up. So what actually is marijuana? The thing is, is marijuana in its original form is a plant, okay? But people are turning it into butter, into butane hash oil, into shatter, and also your kind of standard joints. And what's happening is the different um, forms of marijuana have different percentage of THC and different doses of THC. And the key thing is the dose because the dose is what makes the poison. You know, this was uh, quoted from kind of a Paracelsus who was in one of the almost like a, considered like an original founder of toxicology is everything is poison and at the right dose. And so as the dose, the percent of THC is getting higher and higher, marijuana is becoming more and more poisonous because the dose is so high. So just to put it in perspective, in Colorado, where they first kind of, you know, are known for legalizing recreational marijuana, they started out by saying that, well, we're going to say a single serving of THC in Colorado should be about 10 milligrams. That number, by the way, is based on really no medical evidence. That number is just based on they calculated what they thought was in an average joint at 8% THC and said, well, let's make a single serving edible um, dose the same as about a joint. And so they came up with 10 milligrams. There are other states, by the way, which have chosen to make the legal limit for a single dose uh, the single serving recommendation, excuse me, is five milligrams, but it was 10 milligrams in Colorado. You can go online and Google marijuana, you know, brownies and cookies and find easily find products with 100 milligrams of THC. That's more than 10 times the recommended single serving dose in Colorado. Now, for your occasional marijuana user who only uses every once in a while, most occasional marijuana users report getting high after they receive a dose of two to three milligrams of THC. So the recommended dose in Colorado of 10 milligrams is three times higher than what the occasional marijuana user needs to get high. And there are products out there which are almost 10 times that dose. And who just eats one, one brownie, right, or one cookie, right, especially if they come in a pack of five cookies or something. So you could see here it's very easy to overdose. It's very easy to take way high doses of this, and that gets people in trouble. And it especially gets kids in trouble. So what this graph shows is that basically as marijuana has become more legal, uh, it basically shows that more kids are getting into it, either because they get into their parents' stash, it's more round, it's more available. And in kids, you can get severe toxicity, including coma, including respiratory distress and difficulty, and vomiting and aspiration. And in, and in one study, um, a case series of marijuana intoxication, they showed that actually some kids end up getting intubated because they were so severely respiratory depressed and in such severe coma. So when you think about the high dose of THC and consider the little body of a kid, age nine years and younger, right? If you're thinking little kids who get into this, they can really get a lot of toxicity. And so you have to watch out for this. Um, you could easily get a 911 call for a kid who got into mom or dad's weed brownie and now they're in severe respiratory stress. You may have to provide bag mass ventilation. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a big issue. The issues, unfortunately, don't stop there. So I'm sure many of you have seen this scene from a scary movie where Shorty gets smoked. It turns out that this can kind of, kind of happen. So there are people who try to make what's called butane hash oil, and they do that by essentially pouring butane over marijuana clippings and then applying flame to evaporate the butane vapor off. Now, you can imagine the danger in this by exposing flame to butane vapor, which butane vapor, by the way, is the same thing that's in your, you know, Bic cigarette lighters. And unfortunately, over time, the patients who have had issues with butane hash oil burns and has also up. And just to give you some sense, like these can be incredibly disfiguring burns. These can be, this is just one example from the news. It's available online. You can Google this. Um, severe burns. In fact, there have actually been deaths. People have died from the butane hash oil. And you can 
you can see the the butane kind of bottles here because as you burn butane vapor in the room and it gets exposed to heat it can explode it's extremely dangerous i tell this to you as ems providers because i want you to watch out for this as a scene safety issue if you think there's like a butane hash oil lab or something else going on you have to watch out because it can be incredibly flammable And then before we move on from, from marijuana and cannabinoids, I want to talk a little bit about cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. So this syndrome is in and of itself isn't life-threatening, but it can be severe. Now, this is for someone who ingests lots of THC, so high dose of THC over a long period of time. This is kind of like your frequent um, chronic user of THC who is likely to get this, and this is just a repetitive, intractable vomiting. And it can be severe. I've seen at least one case that led to PEG tube placement, which is a feeding tube placement, because of such severe weight loss due to inability to eat or eat or drink anything. And the treatment for this is to simply stop using marijuana. It tends to get better. Um, these patients often report that they get better with hot showers. Um, certain nausea medicines that ALS has can be helpful for this. Otherwise, the treatment is going to be supportive care and getting them to the hospital. But this is something that can also happen with chronic high use. So let's sum up marijuana. So the dose of psychoactive component marijuana, THC, has basically been growing over time. Legalization and shifting attitudes are making it more available and we're having increased use. Put that together and we're seeing more and more people end up in the ER due to marijuana related issues. Because there are marijuana products such as cookies and other treats that look like kid food, it raises the risk of severe pediatric toxicity in little kids. So you have to watch out for that because kids can get quite sick for this. Watch out for the scene safety of the butane hash oil labs. And then chronic exposure over a long time can lead to complications such as hyperemesis. I also didn't really get involved in, I didn't really um, get into this, but there is some association data with psychosis from prolonged heavy marijuana use. And so the data on that's a little less clear, so I don't discuss it here, but um, it is something to be concerned about and to watch out for. Let's shift gears a little bit to some new stuff about some pathomimetics. Um, I think the really the story here is that meth is back. And in New Jersey, the case of methamphetamine um, related toxicity and seizure of drug specimens is really going up. It's more in pill form. And so we're seeing a lot more meth out there. So keep an eye out for that. The demographic of methamphetamine use is also shifting and increasing. So use among whites has increased. Uh, by triplicate between 2015 and 2019, but use among blacks is actually increasing tenfold. So the demographic is shifting, but overall use is increasing in everyone. So look out for methamphetamine. What are you gonna do about meth? You're gonna provide supportive care? Narcan's not gonna help you here. So to summarize kind of the trend in sympathomimetics, methamphetamine is really becoming, is really increasing. Um, pill forms are becoming more common, and the demographic of who's using it is, is shifting. Let's talk a little bit more about narcotics, since the opioid epidemic is what's really plaguing us right now. So many people, historically, the main narcotic being used on the street was, was heroin, but now we're seeing lots of fentanyl and fentanyl drives and precursors. In fact, you should assume that there's fentanyl in everything. Um, almost all the samples we were seeing when I was working uh, in Camden we're all, all had some kind of fentanyl in it. There's now also a lot of xylazine getting in there, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, and some more unusual stuff like diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl. Caffeine has been found in narcotic samples. Um, there's also mixtures with cocaine and other agents, so you never know quite what you're going to get. And just to put in perspective why fentanyl is such a problem, is it's, it has to do with the relative potency. So if you look at the chart here, right, heroin sits right over here. It takes about a sunflower seed worth to kill you. Fentanyl, on the other hand, is 100 times more potent than morphine up here, which is one time. So it takes only about a sesame seed, so a lot smaller. And then there are other fentanyl derivatives which are even more potent. So fentanyl is just, you need a lot less of it to do damage, and that's why it's, that's why it's problematic. Now, what is xylazine? So xylazine is not an opioid. It's often mixed with opioids, but it's not an opioid. It's analgesic and it's a muscle relaxant. Looks kind of like this. 
And xylazine causes this triad of respiratory depression, bradycardia, and hypotension. So you can look out for this. Now you'll notice this looks very similar to what an opioid overdose looks like. And so clinically, it's almost indistinguishable from opioid overdose. So you're going to manage it like an opioid overdose, but it's hard to distinguish. The problem is xylazine won't respond well to Narcan, whereas an opioid will. These are some of the like brand names and street names you might you might hear out there. If someone says they used one of these, you might you might know there's xylazine in it. So xylazine, like I said, we're going to treat it like an opioid overdose with supportive care, bag mass ventilation. You are going to give Narcan because there might be an opioid component here, which might be enough to reverse with Narcan if you have it. Otherwise, supportive care and you're going to transport them in. So let's summarize our narcotics here. Fentanyl is becoming more the rule than the exception. Xylazine is more and more common. Xylazine doesn't respond to Narcan, but you should still give it because there could be an opioid component mixed in and good supportive care with bag mass, bag mass ventilation, maybe nasopharyngeal airway is going to be really important here. So for those of you who are interested in, in kind of BLS only and want to stop there, you can feel free to stop here. But there is some things in the future of EMS, and I want to get, just give you guys a little bit more education, a little bit of beyond of like what may be coming down the pipeline and next steps uh, in the future. And this is something we were doing uh, with Cooper EMS down in Camden and something I had become familiar with. And um, maybe an ALS agency near you will have it sometime soon. So... When we talk about opioid overdose, it used to be kind of like this. For those of you who haven't seen the movie Bringing Out the Dead, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention it. My program director, Jerry Carroll, basically said that uh, this is a requirement for anyone going into EMS to watch this movie. So feel free to watch it at your leisure. I don't make anything from it. I have no financial incentive for you to watch it, but uh, you'll enjoy it if you're in EMS. Now... What about opiate use disorder? So just how bad is this? How bad is the opioid epidemic? The, the opioid epidemic is so bad, actually our mortality is almost worse than STEMIs, which are heart attacks. And so if you look at the one-year mortality for victims of overdose who received Narcan from EMS, almost 10% died within a year. It's huge. It's more people that are dying from STEMIs. So it's, it's absolutely huge. It's a huge problem. And so beyond Narcan, what can we do about it? So we can treat opiate use disorder with something called Suboxone, which Suboxone is the brand name for medication, the mix of buprenorphine and naloxone. Buprenorphine is a high affinity partial opiate agonist. I'll explain what that is in a little bit. And the Narcan, the naloxone is there basically that if someone tries to inject it, the Narcan gets absorbed and prevents overdose. It's got a long half-life. It's a tablet or a film, and it can be used to treat opiate use and really really help so why why is why is this a good idea why does it help so buprenorphine is a partial opiate agonist so it doesn't make you as high as let's say an equivalent amount of heroin or methadone or fentanyl which are which are full agonists right so it's partial but it's very high affinity so it can kick off other opioids so if you're on an opioid and you take suboxone you can actually go into withdrawal but what you can do is once you get into opiate withdrawal, you can treat withdrawal with Suboxone to stop the withdrawal. And because it's only a partial agonist, it's very hard to overdose on buprenorphine. You know, in adults, it's really difficult. So buprenorphine, you're much less likely to die from overdose. It treats withdrawal. And people who have opiate use disorder can start to function again. And they have a much improved mortality, actually, if they get on a medication-assisted therapy such as Suboxone. So it's really important. And I say coming to an ALS near you because we used to do this and we still continue to do this actually in Camden with Cooper EMS. Um, and so the Cooper folks have a protocol for this. It's used in some other agencies around the country. Um, and I think this is going to gain a foothold and kind of become more and more prominent. And so I want you to have situational awareness about it because it may be coming to an ALS unit near you. And so with that being said, and these are my references for this today's talk, guys. Feel free to reach out with any questions, and I'll see you guys in the next one.